What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, after a little bit of a setback, we are uh, uh, now ready and we are uh, able to actually get this content recorded and send out to you. Unfortunately, uh, we're missing the live part of Lumix Live, but uh, I am in the chat and uh, feel free to ask your questions. Drop the tag at Lumix Cameras. I'll see it on my end. Uh, and, you know, we'll be able to kind of go through this. Uh, so these are, you know, kind of some of the things that happen with uh, live streaming. And, you know, we're going to discuss a lot about that uh, throughout this particular stream. So I want to remind everybody that we have the Lumix Professional Services before we get too far. Lumix Pro Services offers the red tier and the platinum tier here in the United States. These are our service programs that are uh, designed to support photographers and videographers in the industry who are utilizing your equipment uh, either professionally or even just casually. Uh, if you own a Lumix camera, definitely check out the uh, Lumix Red tier, which is our free tier to register for and get yourself in. You get the three-year warranty. Um, service requests are all processed online. It gives you a portal to do all that stuff. And then if you're a little more, um, you know, kind of heavy duty with the use of your cameras, take a look at the Platinum service. Uh, that is our paid tier service that offers you faster turnaround times, discounts on out-of-warranty repairs, uh, loaner equipment, sensor cleanings, lens calibrations, firmware updates, uh, and you get a really sick welcome gift uh, from uh, collaborative strap from Peak Design with us. So... Now that that's out of the way, um, yeah, let's let's kind of get into it. Um, like we said, if you have questions throughout this, drop them in the chat, tagging at Lumix Cameras. I will be monitoring the chat. This is a recorded session because of some challenges we've been having with uh, network upload speeds here in Austin, Texas. So bear with me a little bit and we will get through this. So what are we going to be talking about today, right? So with live streaming, you know, there's so many different ways that you can kind of categorize live streaming. Is that someone who's going to be doing video game streaming? Um, because that's a huge market uh, right now. It's one of the fastest growing markets. Are you someone who's going to be streaming on YouTube or do you prefer to send your streams to Twitch? Do you want to use Facebook Live to stream with? Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of those different platforms. We're going to cover those in a little bit. But we're also going to be talking about the components that make up your streaming. Uh, if you've been following the Lumix Live uh, streams that we've been doing for the last a little over a year now, you'll know, know that we've had some major changes uh, happen over the last year as far as the way the quality is, the cameras that we're using, uh, the kind of just feel and cadence of the actual program. All of these things are... are minor things that you start to build up over time and doing these that you find either give you more efficiency, uh, they could be giving your audience a better, you know, kind of connection with you in the actual process. And I think the big takeaway is to, to know that none of this is a static target. You're always going to be looking and finding new things that, that bring your streaming and bring your content to the next level. So we'll, we'll talk about that. I, we're also going to be talking a lot about some of the different uh, technologies that we use. So, you know, I mentioned that we've gone through a couple of different cameras that we've been using, uh, obviously all Lumix. Uh, so, you know, we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages there and what, you know, why you want to get a better camera and what advantages it gives you. I will also be talking about audio. Audio is probably one of the most overlooked things when it comes into advancing your streams. Um, ultimately people want to be able to hear you. They want to be able to hear you clearly. Uh, and there's a lot of tools out there that make it easier for you. If you're not necessarily someone who's going to go out and spend a couple hundred dollars on a really nice microphone, uh, and amp to get it into your computer. So there's tons of, uh, tools out there that we'll talk about. Uh, and then, you know, we're also going to go through some of the different tiers that you have, uh, you, to even just get into this, because ultimately the most important thing with streaming is if it's something you're passionate about, because let's face it, we've all found new hobbies that we enjoy to do, and the world being as it is, we love to share things that we're all passionate about. Uh, there's different tiers of equipment that you can get into to just be able to get this content out there. Um, there are more hours of content loaded every minute, I believe, than are in existence as of the time, you know, currently on things like YouTube. So 
there's there's things that you can do to stand out from the crowd and there's things that you can do to stay true to what you're trying to get out. So how does this all tie in with Lumix, right? Well, let's start with the cameras. So when we first started doing these Lumix live streams, uh, you know, we kind of fell into the trap or I fell into the trap that the vast majority of people I think do. And that is to do the ultra shallow depth of field and, you know, kind of the whole, I want to take something and put it up in front of camera and show everybody, which is doable. Like I can do this and show you guys, you know, different equipment and everything works. Uh, and, and that's cool and all, but it, you know, didn't necessarily fit the style that I was targeting for here. It was kind of more of an appeasement to what, you know, famous YouTubers and stuff were doing. And that's not a slight on, on their style because everyone has their own style. And because of that, the first camera choice that I naturally went into was I used our S1H for this. Uh, and the S1H is amazing for this kind of setup, but ultimately it meant that I had to lock down my, my flagship camera onto a tripod and, uh, uh, kind of stick with it. And that's what I had to work with. Um, which is fine if you've got the flexibility for it. The vast majority of us don't necessarily want to lock down your main camera for something like this. You want to be able to, you know, go around and use different, uh, different cameras. You want to be able to not have to always remember, I have to have this thing set up this particular way in this location. And consistency is one of the keys online. So as we kind of evolved, new cameras came out, we started switching into using the GH5 for a while. Uh, because I found that I'd actually rather have a little bit more depth of field in the look, uh, just for a styling, uh, feel. Uh, and it was actually just easier for me to set up because I could just throw the GH5 on there. I hadn't been using it that often because I've been working a lot with the full frame cameras, uh, and it just worked. I had more lenses available, uh, to change around with the different focal lengths. Like right now we're using the 12 millimeter 1.4 Sumalux on, uh, the camera that we're using now. And you know, we were golden. I, I got my look, I got everything set that we needed to do and we're good. We had much better image quality. But say you don't work for a camera brand and you have access to all these cameras. Most people don't. Actually, the vast majority of people don't. You know, what, what do you do then? Well, for the vast majority of people, you know, you may be looking at your laptops. And you have some decent functionality with those for, uh, you know, web conferencing, things like that. You're usually limited with the resolution that those cameras have. You're limited with the audio inputs that those, uh, or, yeah, resolutions that those built-in cameras have. Uh, and the limit of what kind of audio is built in with the device. So then it goes down the audio path. And, you know, when we look at what is actually available on these, you'll see this is just my MacBook. So it's one of the more popular, uh, you know, laptops that people typically have in the creative market. And you see, like, I mean, the image quality is not great. It's pixelated. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't want to shoot necessarily down up like this, but just space uh, that I have here. Um, and you see like, so I have to use the built-in microphones. I have to use the, uh, built-in camera and some of the stuff that you can do to actually make that a little bit better, uh, is, you know, lighting, you know, get better lights, put more light on yourself so that the camera doesn't, the laptop doesn't have to up the ISO and the gain to, you know, really be able to actually show anything. So it makes it a little bit better. And this'll be the same with all the new laptop uh, eyesight cameras and windows, hello cameras and all that stuff that's coming out in laptops. They are never going to achieve what a dedicated camera can give you. So when you start looking at, okay, is this camera good enough for what you want to create? Uh, and for some people it can be perfectly fine. I do not ever want to discourage people from getting out there, creating content and sharing your passions with the world. Um, the key, like I said in the beginning, is always to just start somewhere. You can always up your game as you go. Uh, so starting with something like that is perfectly fine. The one thing that I would highly recommend when you start looking at, at starting to stream is definitely look at a microphone as the first thing you're going to do. At a bare minimum, get a separate microphone than what's built into the actual uh, computer. 
they're not the greatest at picking up a good range. They'll either sound ultra tinny or they'll sound ultra modulated and kind of digital. Uh, and like I said in the beginning, audio is a very important thing that often get, gets overlooked. And there are so many options out there for USB powered microphones uh, that are relatively inexpensive and are going to massively up your game. So we'll talk about that a little bit after we talk about the cameras. The second thing, you know, as you start to look is, well, okay, now you've decided you actually want to go with a camera. Well, how do you interface with it? Are you going to go get a capture card or are you going to be using, um, you know, some of the USB functionality that camera manufacturers and Lumix has deployed into our cameras? Um, that is really just going to come down to your particular plan. Even using a, like a G100, using the uh, Lumix webcam drivers is going to be an infinitely better looking image than what a laptop uh, camera is going to give you. Just on the fact that you've got a sensor in the G100 and some of the other, or basically any, any camera, is going to be infinitely larger than what your laptop uh, camera is going to have sensor wise. So all of us that love looking at you know larger sensors or better image quality, that's a definitive. Micro Four Thirds is going to give you a definitively better image than what your laptop's going to give you. They can shoot at higher ISOs and still maintain a much cleaner looking image. Uh, and then it just kind of compounds from there. You go to full frame, it's even better. You go up to medium format, it's even better than that, somewhat. So look at what you want to do, the environment that you want to go with, the look and the style of the stream that you want to do. And that can help determine, you know, is the webcam drivers or are the webcam drivers good enough for your particular platform to just go to that next step? Uh, if you're someone who knows that, okay, you want to be doing this stuff in 1080 60p or you want to be streaming in 4k for some reason, um, I highly advise not necessarily streaming in 4k. It's incredibly difficult. It's very demanding on your wireless network or your wired network. And the vast majority of people don't have the upload bandwidth to do that. So, We'll save that one. Uh, but say you want to do 1080p 60 like what we do here. Well, for something like that, you're going to want to have to inter interface into your computer through some sort of capture device. Now, we use currently the ATEM Mini uh, for our camera inputs. This allows us to take up to a 1080p 60, uh, 1080 60p signal for the ATEM Mini that we have uh, and broadcast that out in 60 frames per second. Uh, you can get higher end capture cards. Uh, there are many capture cards from Elgato. Uh, I believe some of the new ATEM capture uh, devices or ATEM switchers will also allow now up to uh, 4K in some different uh, models. And you can 100% do that. Uh, that definitely maximizes the quality that you're going to do. Uh, and it's just an interface that you look there, but now you're looking at saying, you know, do you want to spend a hundred bucks? Do you want to spend $500? Do you want to spend a thousand dollars on, uh, switching devices? Uh, all of this, you just kind of take into account into your, you know, what, what you want to do step by step. Uh, like I said, we've basically settled and we're working with the ATEM mini because it does everything that we need. The times where we do want to actually broadcast in 4K, uh, we are actually now covered to do this because I can do it a very different way than using the switcher. Uh, however, I am limited to one or two cameras uh, just because of my network if I want to do 4K streaming. Uh, and that's by using the camera that we're, we're working with now for our Lumix live streams, and that's the BGH-1. So you can see I have one of my BGH-1s set up right over here because uh, we're going to be taking a look at my uh, setup here in a moment. Uh, and then I have the other main one uh, right up there. So if we look, you'll see I have my other BGH one is set up right up here. Uh, and then we have the main one there. And that's the nice thing with the switcher is that I can just click which HDMI input I want and easily just jump camera angles. So looking at the different options you have, you do not have to go to a BGH one to do something like this. Um, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, you have to go for a $2,000 camera. You have to go for a $3,500 camera, whatever, you know, top of the line cameras out there. Uh, you can 100% do this with a camera like the G100. You can do this with some of the point and shoot cameras. Uh, although there are different limitations, the key that you want to look for 
is that the camera offers a clean HDMI out and ideally that it offers standby autofocus control. Uh, and what I mean by that is some point and shoot cameras on the market that are gonna still give you much better image quality than a laptop does. Uh, in some cases, when you're outputting over HDMI, they're really just as a monitoring HDMI out. So that means that you could run into two things. Either it's not going to live output the video feed, so you're gonna be uh, a little limited in what you can actually do with it. Uh, some cameras just don't even output uh, HDMI when you're in video recording standby. Uh, and then others will allow you to autofocus continuous while doing this. Others you have to focus once and then continue from there. So take a look at the different cameras that are out there. Uh, one of the most popular cameras used for live streaming to first get into this is still to this day our G7. Uh, it's a micro four thirds camera. It's kind of, if you've been in the Lumix community long enough, you know the G7. Uh, it's a solid performing little micro four thirds camera that has a, an HDMI out for plugging into switchers and capture cards. Uh, it will let you autofocus while it's uh, uh, running there. Uh, and it's gonna give you an interchangeable lens mount and much better image quality than anything else that you're gonna get for smaller setups. And usually you can find them for really inexpensive um, because of one, the age of the camera, uh, and two, usually there's some promotions running on them. So, uh, and the G7 is the US name for it. We, uh, I think that one's G70 in some other regions. Uh, so you just look for that series camera. But as you start looking at the different camera and the different options there, you know, you kind of settle which one that you're ready to go with and you just start filming. Um, once you plug these things in, uh, whether you're using something like an Elgato that we're using or you use something, or uh, sorry, not Elgato, if you're using something like an A10 Mini like we're using uh, or some like the Elgato products, uh, they're usually very simple and straightforward to work with. Plug them into USB on the computer, typically USB 3.0, uh, plug your HDMI cable into it, and then you just switch the source over so that it it pulls the that webcam feed. Uh, and at that point, you're pretty much set to go. Uh, when you're doing it this way with something like an ATEM or the Elgatos or, you know, Avermedia, any of those uh, capture cards, your audio is typically going to be contained with the HDMI. So if you have a good microphone that you like using already with your camera, you can just plug that into your camera if it's got a microphone input, uh, or if you're using a camera like ours that offers the XLR1, you could be using that as well. Uh, and your audio and video is fed in together, you're synced, everything's golden, you just continue going. But if you want to start upping that audio quality, uh, this is where it can start to get maybe a little more challenging because you start separating your video and your audio feeds uh, to get better quality out of either. Now, I have a couple of microphones here that I'm going to actually use as a little bit of a demonstration with everybody to kind of show you what you should be expecting uh, out of the different uh, you know options that are out there. So we're gonna take a look at here. So I've got my picture, 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 there you go. So when it comes to microphones, um, you have a ton of different options. Actually, let me do it this way. So when it comes to microphones, you have a, a couple different options. You have something like this, which is a uh, just a condenser microphone. It's a relatively inexpensive one off Amazon, and it works perfectly fine for what we're doing. But then you also have other options like wireless lavaliers, uh, or you even have other options like these little tiny USB microphones that plug in over USB and just get you your audio uh, into your computer. And each one of these are going to have very different sound profiles that you kind of want to look at. And what I want to do here is actually show you, uh, as you saw a little bit before, as I drop my headphones, what we're going to do is take a look at the different uh, kind of sound that you're going to get out of these different microphones uh, for your different kind of shooting and what you can do to actually make a relatively inexpensive microphone sound a little bit better depending on your environment. So we're going to jump to my desktop view here. And right now you'll see here I have uh, NVIDIA Broadcaster open. 
Now, NVIDIA Broadcaster is one of those technologies that I mentioned uh, in the beginning that I've now begin began to utilize for a while uh, because I'm in an environment where uh, my particular studio uh, is a bedroom. Right behind the camera, literally the wall right behind the camera, is my central air, so my air conditioning in this apartment. Uh, so anytime that kicks on, and since I live in Texas, we can get, you know, 100 plus degree days relatively easily throughout the summer, means the air conditioner is probably going to be kicking on in the middle of a stream. And that can cause some, some issues. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to kick the fan on on my uh, air conditioner so that you can kind of hear what, what we're actually talking about with this. So most times when you are picking up audio, uh, you'll have different microphone selections. Like we said, we talked about the, the three main ones that we're talking about today. Uh, a little USB powered omnidirectional mic or somewhat directional microphone. You have a condenser mic like this, and then we have wireless omnidirectional that is attached right here. Because each one's pickup patterns are gonna be so different, external noises will start to really feed into the stream that you're doing. So you wanna look at you know, what, what's in the environment and how can you help fix that. So some microphones come with software that allow you to apply different noise gates and uh, uh, different limiters on them. And that's cool and all, but not everyone's gonna have that capability. Well, luckily, if you are a uh, desktop PC user, uh, and I'll switch to this camera. So if you're a desktop PC user, you have a really cool option if you happen to be uh, someone who has an RTX uh, NVIDIA graphic card, graphics card. Uh, not everyone's gonna have this, and I think some of the GTX cards might now have the capability to do this, but it might not work as well. And basically what it what allows me to use is this software called NVIDIA Broadcaster. Uh, and it's a noise filter. Uh, it's an it's a intelligent noise filter that uses the actual graphics card to process everything that's coming into the uh, in as audio and then clean it for different kind of noise profiles and then send out just the voice that you're hearing. So if you've watched game streaming, this is a pretty popular thing that a lot of YouTubers use for cleaning up the noise. Now, right now I have this turned on and we're using this particular microphone, so this condenser mic. Now, if I flip this off, you'll see now it is flipped off and you can hear the room tone that you've got, right? So you can hear that air conditioner, you hear that kind of just nastiness in the background and it's it gets very distracting. Now I could go into the uh, ATEM switcher and fiddle around with the noise gates and things like that and kind of do it through a hardware based uh, setup. But I've always found that, you know, you either have to be really good at programming, um, you, you know, playing around with those features, uh, but ultimately you want something easy and simple. So if you happen to be lucky enough to have uh, an RTX card uh, and, and you're on Team Green, unfortunately Team Red, uh, AMD doesn't have, as far as I know, anything like this. So, sorry, um, I kind of mix Team Red and Green in my computer anyway. Uh, this is a super easy way to get really, really clean audio. So again, we've got it turned off here and I'm sure that it's annoying the heck out of people because of that, that air conditioning noise. So if I flip this back on, you'll see you should now be hearing that the vast majority of that sound has been cleared up. Uh, you're probably not really getting any kind of issues with uh, the kind of sound that would be coming from that air conditioner. And even in the scope that I have here uh, on my uh, OBS, it looks much cleaner. It's not peaking. It's not, uh, you know, kind of bouncing around with what you have up there. So what does this, you know, kind of do? You know, this is a relatively nice microphone setup. But what about those USB microphones, the inexpensive ones that you can buy uh, that just are great for travel and get you a much better sound than what your laptop does? Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the noise reduction off here. So we're going to have to deal with that a little bit. Now I'm going to actually go in here and I'm going to change which microphone is being used for the casting here. 
So you'll see that right here I have, I'm using a Samsung Go mic, uh, and just as a point of clarity, this is nothing against Samsung. I love this little microphone, especially when we were traveling, this thing was great uh, to have because I hate the microphones in my laptops. Um, so we're just gonna be using this in this particularly noisy environment. So now you see we're using the Samsung Go mic. Um, it picks up a lot more. It's gonna be a lot more tinny because of the way that my room's designed. I don't have noise uh, deadening panels uh, anywhere in here um, because I've been able to manage it without. But a microphone like this, which is a little bit further away than this one, is gonna get you a little bit better sound than what your laptop's gonna do as far as the pickup goes. Uh, but you can run into some other issues because they're not really going to be necessarily a shotgun microphone that's going to really target how that audio is. Uh, these are typically more omnidirectional, so it's going to pick up a lot more of the room. You're going to pick up more of the sound reflections off the walls, and it kind of, in some cases, may be disheartening if you spend the money on it, and it's just not really doing what you want it to do. So this is where that broadcaster software comes in. So now if I flip the noise reduction on, you can hear how much of that just got cleared up. But the difference is you can also hear how processed the sound is. So that's something to kind of be well aware of. The more it has to be processed by any kind of noise filtration, whether you're using something like the RTX system that I'm using, uh, or if you're using even something that's in line, the more processing you have to do to it, the more uh, it's going to sound processed. It's gonna sound digital. Uh, and if I pick this microphone up and bring it actually a little bit closer and try to not peak out the audio level so much, it does let me speak at a lower volume, but you still run into some of that kind of challenge that it's relatively kind of not the best for what we're doing. It's great for situations where you may be doing something like a web conference and you want much clearer audio, it's gonna be infinitely better. So you've got a couple of those different choices there. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch back to this particular microphone because I like the way this sound mics, this sound mics, the way this mic sounds better than some of the other ones that I have. So we've got a much cleaner sounding uh, setup here. But now what about things like lavalier microphones? So when we first started these streams, I had been using the Sennheiser AVX wireless mics. Uh, and luckily enough for the first apartment I was in down here, uh, the air conditioner was separated further away, so I didn't really have that much of an issue with that noise. And I was able to tune the, uh, the levels down a little bit. But say you want to use the lavalier instead and you want to really get a better sounding quality because you're stuck with the onboard audio or you don't have this microphone or you don't really want to go um, to a USB powered mic. You want to keep it all in line with the HDMI that comes out of the camera. And this principle works the same with anyone that's plugging in a 2.5 millimeter uh, or 3.5 millimeter uh, microphone into your camera. It'll all feed the same way into something like an ATEM or an Elgato. So let's uh, change the microphones over here, but first I'm gonna turn the noise reduction off. So again here, noise reduction off. We're going to swap the microphones from this microphone to my Sennheiser. So now we're using the Sennheiser microphone. And if I pick this up a little bit, you'll see that you know, you're actually hearing it. And if I move this microphone far out of the way, you'll see that now I'm using the Sennheiser microphone. I'm getting that audio into this. Uh, and this is without noise reduction. So the nice thing is the wireless microphone like this, the AVX system or any other of the type, they give you more flexibility. You don't have to have a boom arm and a microphone sitting in the middle of your view, even though that's the kind of the YouTube style these days. So it works relatively well, but say you just don't like that look and you wanna have something that's, you know, gives you more freedom. If you're gonna be turning away and, you know, walking around, or if you're a photographer and you're doing an actual demonstration where you're away from the computer. Well, this is a good option. 
but it's an omnidirectional microphone. So that means that I'm picking up that air conditioning sound. And you can hear it. And I can see it on my uh, levels on OBS. But now if I turn the noise reduction back on, you see how much of that noise gets cleared out. Now again, because there has to be so much that's processed and cleaned up on this, it's going to sound a little more digital. It's going to sound a little, uh, tinny might not be the right word, but it, it's just going to sound a little odd. And these are the different trade-offs that you kind of want to look at and see, well, what, what makes the most sense for your particular style of uh, audio? Is audio the number one thing for your particular audience? Uh, is video, the actual image quality, the number one thing? And you can maybe take a step back on the audio and make do for a little bit. Um, always look around, see which one works the best in, in your option if you have the flexibility. But again, just like with the cameras, don't let don't let um, perfection be your enemy. Uh, even though we all strive to get the perfect stream, the best video content out there, a lot of times we can end up, um, I forget what the phrase is, missing the forest for the trees or something like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm horrible with analogies. Uh, but, you know... Getting the content out there, making sure that it's clear and concise is going to be one of the more important things that you want to kind of go with. Everything else just becomes a nice added benefit. Um, upping your game, getting a better feel, getting a better look, getting a better sound. Each things you can pick off one at a time, um, just like we did. You don't ever have to really do this, you know, all at once and make sure it's perfect from day one. Uh, you're always going to find things that you want to change as you go through this. Uh, and I'm actually going to switch back to the microphone that I like using better, which is this one. Uh, and again, you hear a little bit of that difference between the way these microphones sound. Now, um, you have a couple of the other things here. So pop filters, windscreen, stuff like that. They're good additions to have on there, depending on your particular style. Um, I have... Depending on how I, the words that I pronounce, you can have plosive, I think they're called plosives. So pop filters are gonna be nice for that. Uh, makes it a little bit just better for the audience. So you've got all those different audio options. Um, the only one that I didn't cover is the actual built-in audio on the cameras, uh, which uh, works pretty well. Um, you get a, a pretty decent sound out of a lot of the different um, built-in uh, microphones that come with, with these cameras. But what you will notice is that a lot of times you're not necessarily going to have maybe the, the best isolation. Because again, those are always going to be designed more as omnidirectional. So I think I have this set up right. We're going to jump to this video feed and we're going to pull the audio that's coming right from the camera here. And we did this on the IP streaming uh, broadcast that we did uh, where I showed you the audio differences there. So uh, if I go over, so we've got camera two here. I'm going to turn this microphone off and we'll use what's coming through the, uh, the HDMI. So now you should be able to see really loud, really peaked. I'm going to speak maybe a little bit quieter so that I'm not blowing people's ears out. This is the built-in microphones that's coming with the uh, BGH-1, but they're tuned. But those microphones are tuned incredibly hot uh, just because I haven't actually touched anything. So it can work. It takes a little bit more uh, time to actually process them and, uh, you know, kind of really work and make sure how that's going to sound. It's also right in path with the air. So you can use built-in microphones, but they definitely work better when you're outdoors uh, and you're, you're having that, that better way to actually kind of record and the ambient sound is actually kind of going to work for you. So, so let's see, we covered the basics on some of the cameras. We covered some of the basics on the microphones. Well, maybe not really the basics, maybe a little bit more than the basics. Um, let's go into, let's retouch back actually on a little bit of the cameras and why, 
why particularly we're using the BGH ones uh, for our live streaming. So if you're someone who does, you know, kind of instructional uh, videos or you are looking to kind of expand what your broadcast is or your streaming and you want to be able to show multiple angles. Um, and this works amazing for uh, wedding videographers, wedding photographers that are still, you know, kind of photographing the wedding, but families are still not necessarily able to fully meet up with each other and, uh, you know, kind of be there to, to share in the experiences, whether it's a wedding or an event or, you know, whatever. Um, the BGH1 has become our go-to for the vast majority of this stuff because we have a ton of control over these cameras without the need to have to go physically touch the camera, change settings in them. Uh, we have our software devoted to it. So if we take a look at my second camera angle here, you'll see on this particular screen, I've got my uh, the Lumix Tether for uh, multicam software open. And what's cool about this software is that I have the ability to, and we'll make sure you can at least still see my face instead of just my nose. Um, we have the ability to independently control each of these cameras. So right now I've got, uh, on this particular window here, I've got both of my cameras connected via LAN. So I've got them connected via the ethernet cable into a network switch. So I can control both of these. And we're looking at my uh, main feed here. So we've got autofocus running, we're center point autofocus on this one. If I flip over to my main camera here, which is just the, the face cam that we're using, you'll see same thing. I've got center point autofocus uh, and it lets me monitor what the looks are for each one. So this can become an incredibly good tool for situations where like how I've got this set up where I'm actually kind of showing you the one view, but then I'm also working on you know, the kind of second view for just the different look that you guys want to actually work with. Um, where this software really, really comes in handy is because like we said, I have multiple camera feeds here and I have multiple different, uh, you know, inputs that I want to work with and how I want to show, I can easily come in and say, well, you know, the, the look on this particular camera is maybe a little too bright. So I want to bring the ISO down a little bit. I want to darken it up a little bit. Or, you know, I actually really want to have more information showing, you know, on the desktop here. So I can actually come in and bring up my ISO. So say we'll go to 1600. Now all my highlights have blown out, but I've got a little bit more detail here. I've got some more detail on the messy disaster that's called my desk today. Uh, or I can just come back in and say, well, you know what? I'd rather actually just have it look a little bit better. Uh, and all of that control is done on the computer and it's adjusting that camera and I don't ever have to touch it. So whether the camera's here uh, or attached to the 50 foot H or, uh, ethernet cable that I'm gonna have run in the new studio that we'll be moving into at the end of the month, uh, I can have this camera mounted up on my ceiling and everything will be you know, perfect for it. I'll be able to actually work with it, not have to go up and touch the camera, play around with it. I can control focus from here if I want to do manually focusing. Uh, the only thing that, you know, you end up having to control uh, manually is the zoom. So we have relatively short ceilings and I'm like 6'2", so I can reach the ceiling and adjust the focus so I don't have to put like a gimbal up or a uh, structure up to, you know, be able to control this stuff. So it makes it a little easy. But that's the crazy side of, of the streaming functionality. You never have to do these kinds of things. It really just goes into what your, what your needs are, what your particular style is, what you're trying to get across as far as the content goes. Um, a year ago, I never would have been able to really put a lot of this stuff together. I didn't have the space. I didn't have the lighting. Uh, I had the cameras and I had the capture. Well, I had a capture card because that was during the drought when you couldn't find them. So, you know, it was kind of difficult, but now you're starting to get a lot of products that are coming out that make it a little bit easier for you. So this is why we use the BGH1 with it. I can do all of this control. If I jump over and, you know, say we're looking at this and I want to actually have you guys zoom in and take a look at what we've got over here, you know, I can actually punch in, I can back out and it's, it's relatively simple for this. Now, 
So we've covered cameras, we've covered the audio. What about lighting? So lighting, uh, for some people, it's the most important thing. For others, it's kind of an afterthought. Uh, you have so many different options out there for lighting. You have everything from, you know, we've talked about them on these streams before, about, you know, different companies like Nanlite and Aperture and all of those other companies that are making the small portable LED, uh, you know, bicolor LED uh, or even RGB LED um, uh, lighting solutions. And they're all going to be, you know, pretty solid for what you want to do. You can get into the argument and the conversation about, uh, you know, the CRI and the color accuracy and how, you know, this one is better than that one and, and you know, all of that minutia of it. But ultimately, you want to get lighting that provides you the best look that you're going for. Just because one person online or myself says, hey, this is the way we do it, doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to mesh with your style. You know, for us, I'm a, a very kind of, I want flat lighting. I want it to be evenly lit here. I want to have the background be, you know, relatively separated out uh, from a lighting perspective and, you know, kind of let the colors that we use, you know, kind of sh show through. Uh, not everyone's going to want that. Some people will want just a totally blown out background with just kind of creamy bokeh-ness. Um, I think that's a word. Uh, and and, and kind of just go from that as I punch the microphone. Uh, that can work. Uh, and especially if that's your style, that's cool. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you want to kind of look and see what lighting works best for you. Now we use, as you can see here, we're using the uh, Elgato key lights. We actually have two of them set up. So I have one off camera here and one main one right here. Uh, and the reason for that is actually um, fairly, fairly uh, simple and straightforward actually. So uh, what I'm gonna do actually is I'm going to punch this camera in here and we're gonna move it. So I can actually show you. So the reason why I use the Elgato key lights and why these were the ones that we decided with is because I am a big proponent of, I want to be able to just uh, control everything from my computer. And you get that cool effect, right? There you go. Um, I wanna be able to control everything from my computer for these two particular lights. So that means that I can use the Elgato stuff that has built in desktop controls just click on this, click on the Elgato control, and now I have my color temperature control, so I can make it really warm in here. I can make it ultra cool. I'm gonna set this back to 6,000 Kelvin because that's what we typically stream at. I can make it ultra bright. I can make it really dark. And the cool thing about these is that these lights have a ton of power. So I am at 13% on these lights. If I go to 100, it's kind of ridiculous how bright they are. So, you know, you start looking at the different options that you have here, and I have to remember where I had these set up. I think I had these, yeah, ah, a little bit brighter than before. So this is the important reason why these are the lights that we chose, because I have this control center here. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's gonna work best for you. Um, you know, one of the other cool things out there are the, those Aperture MC lights that I, I love using those Aperture MC lights. And what's cool with those is that I have mobile connectivity to do those. So it's not very different from, you know, what I have with these particular lights. I can still use my phone and I can control the intensity of them. I can control the color balance of it. I can even change the colors if I want. And, you know, I'm good. Everything works, works the way I want them. Uh, so you, you've got that, all of those different options available for the way you want your lighting to go. Um, the other side of this, and we've talked about this before on the Lumix live streams, um, the other reasoning why we're using something like a GH5, a S1H, or a BGH1, uh, is because of the accent lighting that I use back here. So back here, we've got, um, these are just Hue LEDs, so Philips LEDs, um, and again, these are controllable lights on a mobile device. So I've got orange up now. I can change it to green. Um, I can do it red, you know, really whatever kind of look you want. Uh, 
but lights refresh at a different cycle rate um, that a lot of times if you've been recording you'll see banding show up uh, it could be like an orange band that would go from top to bottom or bottom to top I forget which way I think it's from top to, uh, bottom to top uh, and those can be incredibly distracting so when we use something like the um, Lumix Tether for multicam software this is where I can come in and say, well, I want to change my shutter speeds to degrees. So I want to be able to change what that actually looks like um, to cancel out the flicker rate here. So you'll see that a lot of times I'm using 216 degrees because that gets me the, uh, the ability to use these lights without having the, the flickering issue that uh, you can typically run into. So... As far as the lighting goes, um, again, you, you can really pick whatever kind of lighting you want. Uh, I, I think looking at all of these different individual pieces uh, is, is kind of a, a big thing to get yourself set up from a hardware perspective. Uh, the, last, uh, the last two things that I want to talk about are you know, more for the photography group, uh, the photography and videography group. Um, a lot of us have gotten, you know, a lot more time to work and play with uh, different editing styles, different uh, projects, and some of us have found over the the last year that, you know, we may actually be some great teachers. I know there's a ton of people that watch uh, Lumix Live that I've interacted with in uh, the different forums, and you guys are amazing at helping each other and you know, kind of guiding others through, you know, their, their challenges or your editing styles. Um, there's always people out there looking for advice. Um, aside from the troll comments that happen online, you know, there is such a wealth of knowledge that all of us can share and, uh, you know, help bring up the community as a whole that this streaming platform is an amazing way to do that whether again you're on twitch youtube uh facebook live whatever it is um these are all things that we can be doing with our cameras uh to to make this a better experience for people so one of the things that um that i've been doing a lot because uh, i i had up until recently i was doing classes for our local dealer networks uh, for end users and customers that want to actually learn about different styles is actually showing, you know, Photoshop walkthroughs or Lightroom walkthroughs. So one of the cool things that uh, you can do when you've got your streaming setup running is do stuff like this. So I've got Photoshop open here. I've got an image that I captured with my S1R, which is a, um, a full spectrum infrared converted or full spectrum converted uh, S1R here. Um, to capture a specific look that we used to be able to photograph with in the 60s and 70s, uh, even through the 80s. So really, you're able to take this whole kind of setup and go right in and say, okay, I want to be able to click this. I want to uh, come in here. I want to, you know, actually demonstrate how I would edit this photo and be able to have, you know, the kind of one-on-one -on -one face interaction here. So just for quick demonstration sake, I'm just going to throw auto on that. Um, I'm going to throw up some uh, texturing here. And I'm looking out to uh, actually, you know, kind of show this stuff and actually, you know, kind of, you know, walk through an editing process. I'm able to go in here and, and clearly show people how I actually do, you know, some of these adjustments. So... If anyone's ever, and this is a little sidebar, if anyone's ever actually used an um, uh, uh, older film called Aerochrome, you'll know that uh, uh, different styles have different looks. Uh, Aerochrome had a very uh, pink, uh, reddish kind of foliage look. Uh, you have typically, you know, kind of vibrant uh, reds and blues and things like that here. So I'm able to go in, give my demonstration like this, walk through... Uh, how everything works, show it in real time, and be able to educate people on how this works. This will be the same that we've done during uh, some of the other streams, you know, where we're talking about, uh, you know, how does ProRes RAW work or how does B-RAW work in something like Premiere. Now, 
what I think a lot of people uh, miss on this, and I'm going to turn this camera to show this particular stream screen. You can see my coffee there because uh, I have not finished that yet. So the way you would do some of this stuff, uh, and I apologize that I'm having to do this this way, but um, I just never hooked up the rest of my stuff, but I want to show you how this part works. Uh, actually, I can do it this way. So now we've got the whole fun thing here. So if, if you want to show somebody how to uh, actually be able to, you know, set up and, and demonstrate something like Photoshop, literally uh, all you're going to do is create a new uh, source here. Then you're going to look on the different, uh, uh, or create a new scene, go into sources, add your camera, which you'll see is highlighted in blue, add your audio source, which in this case is that NVIDIA broadcaster, and then add which display you want to actually use. Once you have that, that is the look that you're going to get. So we've got my main setup here. I've got my camera down in the corner over here, but I can also just come in and I can just, you know, kind of shift where my camera is so that you know, it just kind of looks better on, on how you actually want the, the camera to go. So it, it, it makes it a really easy way to get content across, uh, be able to share different, um, you know, kind of experiences with people and passions. And, you know, kind of talking about passions and the different things that are out there. Um, there's a lot of people that do, you know, music streaming. Uh, online. And one of the things that a lot of people, you know, kind of uh, have looked at is, you know, well, how do you bring all of this together? How do you bring in the ability to do uh, sound and, uh, you know, the microphone and everything all together? You know, what, what kind of works with that? And there's a couple different tools that you can go with. So I play guitar and I'm not actually going to pull it down and, and, uh, uh, bore anybody with, with my, uh, you know, kind of mediocre playing, but there are different devices that you can pick up that allow you to connect in over USB to then give you your different, uh, controls. So this is just, uh, uh, it's called PreSonos. It's just one I found on Amazon. Um, gives me two microphone inputs with a uh, quarter inch input as well as XLR. You get different level controls, uh, master in and out. You have headphone monitoring in the back of this as well as a couple of different outputs. And these can give you some very different uh, methods of getting your audio in. So if you're someone who's looking and you know you want to really expand in and you want to be able to do uh, instructional videos, uh, for music, for um, just anything that involves a higher quality sound than you would normally be experiencing. A device like this, any kind of USB controlled uh, you know, audio input, uh, can be a huge benefit for you because it gives you more analog controls that can be then converted in so that it plugs into your, your computer. Something like this, uh, I can plug this in because it's USB, I can plug this into my MacBook if I'm on the go. It does not need external power. It's literally just powered over the USB. So it lets me have that flexibility across the board where I can take one camera, this, and a microphone, and I'm totally good to go. I'll have my higher quality audio. I have my high quality video. Uh, if I need to be able to plug in and say I, I've got two people, uh, coming into a conversation or say I have three people, it's myself and that I'm going to be interviewing two guests. I could have the two guests piped into this as a feed that comes into something like OBS. Uh, and then I've got all of the different inputs ready to go and just pipe into my actual feed. Um, the last, you know, kind of thing to talk about, and I know I said this before, uh, but the actual last thing is actually something I wanted to talk about on the MacBook here. So uh, I'm not really going to be talking to cam. Well, I can talk to camera. There you go. Hi, everybody. So one of the last things that, uh, you know, is kind of really 
cool to, to be able to work with is, is how many different options there are out there for software to get your vision out into something like YouTube or Facebook. So as you can see here on my Mac, I've got OBS open. And OBS is the, you know, kind of gold standard that the vast majority of people use because it's simple, it's streamlined, uh, it works Mac and PC, I think it even works on Linux. So it's easy to use. But for some people, it can be rather plain. Um, it's not really a whole lot of graphic overlays. It's not really, you know, maybe necessarily the prettiest looking. Uh, you do have the ability to do things like studio mode, so you can queue up different scenes uh, for what you want to uh, view. Uh, but it's, it's a very utilitarian product. It works great, and it does what it's supposed to do. But if you're someone who's into, say, video game streaming, um, which is something I like to do, uh, especially over the last year when, you, you know, we've had some downtime. Uh, there's a variant of this called Streamlabs, uh, which is still OBS. Uh, it's, it's based on OBS. It's all kind of the same thing. <coughs> but what Streamlabs uh, offers is some of these different, uh, you know, kind of different things here. So stream starting soon, live scenes, be right back stuff, ending screens if you're offline. Uh, it gives you all of these kind of templates to get yourself going. So you, if you're not great with, um, you know, kind of creating any of this kind of stuff, creating the actual assets you need to have a notification box or have a uh, border and frame around your actual webcam, these can be uh, great tools uh, for, for your particular, um, you know, kind of streaming setup. Like I can move the webcam over here. I can move all of this stuff over here if I want. And it literally is just a, a template. So, you know, everyone always likes to do the whole, you know, uh, I forget what the company is, the website company that, you know, is super easy to design a website with. A lot of these things are going to be very similar to that. So it makes it easy for you to get in, create a style that's yours, get your content out. Because again, not all of us, I mean, well, a lot of us live and breathe, you know, our, our jobs, our video, photo, the things that we're doing day to day. But there are such cool things that we can do with our equipment that can also be good stress relievers, can be good ways to uh, reach out to a broader audience and, you know, kind of share experiences and knowledge with other people. So, that kind of wraps up what I, you know, kind of had intended to plan uh, to talk about here. Um, I was going to be talking about, uh, you know, kind of the network uh, requirements and stuff like that for streaming, uh, but clearly, I've had some issues with that recently. So everything that we've talked about, you know, you want to, you want to make sure that you're looking at what your uh, capabilities are with your uh, internet service provider. Uh, in whatever region you're in. Uh, different platforms like YouTube and uh, Twitch and Facebook have different requirements for what uh, bitrate is recommended to upload at. So, uh, for example, if you're someone who wants to stream to Twitch, uh, Twitch requires, uh, at least last I checked, uh, 6,000 megabit per second. And if you go any higher than that, you just get a black screen. So, you know, look on their site, uh, it, and, and it'll tell you what, what the actual bit rate is that you want to be sending the video out at. Uh, and that'll be, ideally, usually you'll be doing 1080, 1080-60p, 1080, 30p. Um, for the most part, people typically do not stream in 24 frame per second. Um, uh, I wouldn't advise it. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of you out there viewing are probably uh, used to shooting in 24 frame um, because of the cinematic you know, kind of feel and look out of it. Uh, but a lot of times live streaming, especially if you're doing demonstration work, you want to shoot faster frame rates, at least 30 frames per second, uh, because every individual frame is sharper. So if you're trying to show text, it's going to look cleaner and it's going to look better uh, for you know what you're actually going to be showing people. Um, if you're someone streaming on YouTube, you can be streaming 4K 60p if you wanted to. Uh, typically, you're going to need something like 25 to 30 uh, megabit per second upload speeds for your internet to do that. Uh, so, you know, run some of the speed tests on your particular connection and, and see what you've got. Uh, it's also highly advised to make sure that you're hardwired uh, into your network. 
relying on wireless signals while they've gotten infinitely better than they were years ago um, with the different standards there. Uh, hardwired is still going to be the fastest that you're going to get um, for, for that kind of uh, capability. Uh, and then, you know, when you look at, say, Facebook, uh, Facebook Live or Facebook Streaming, that's where you're going to be giving up resolution. Uh, Facebook Live Streaming is only 720p. You can do 720p 60 frames per second, uh, and they're going to be at lower bit rates, so you're going to be probably somewhere between 3 to 6 megabit per second. Uh, but you've got the tools there. Um, the cameras and everything that you, you have are going to be able to feed into this, get you a better overall look, uh, get you a better overall sound uh, when you start working with different audio and different microphones. Uh, and then, yeah, you, you're you pretty much ready to go after that. Um, that that actually wraps up um, the stream for today. Uh, again, this was supposed to be an actual live streamed event uh, that I'd be able to actively take your guys' questions and answer them throughout this uh, broadcast. Unfortunately, due to uh, um, uncontrollable situations uh, with my internet service provider, which uh, those that were over on the Facebook group that uh, did point out the irony uh, in not being able to live stream the live streaming event, um, the, the, the irony is not lost on me. Uh, instead, this is the YouTube broadcast or uh, the, the YouTube premiere uh, which means that, you know, we were in the chat and we were able to answer questions. We'll still be answering questions um, through the comments. So if you have questions that didn't get answered throughout the live stream, uh, drop it in the comment section. Um, our comments are moderated uh, just because, uh, you know, profanity, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, we, we do watch those, quest those comments and we do answer to them uh, and, and have them posted live so everybody else can see them. So with that... Uh, I want to give everyone one last reminder. We have the Lumix Pro Services platform out there, the free free tier, which is our red level, and the platinum tier, which is our paid level. Uh, if, you, if you own Lumix cameras, get yourself over there, get yourself registered on these platforms, use the QR code, uh, and uh, you know, kind of see what the whole program is about. Other than that, thank you all so much. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody next week where I've been uh, assured by my uh, uh, internet provider that things should be fixed within the next 24 hours. Uh, and uh, we'll be joined by Jordan Bunch next week uh, to talk about video production for distribution. Uh, it's a topic we haven't really covered that in depth before, uh, but Jordan recently had a, uh, a documentary that he shot released on Amazon Prime and uh, kind of figured it would be kind of a good point to talk with, uh, talk with Jordan to see you know, what, what that process was. Uh, going through the actual filming was the idea always to be uh, distributed on something like Amazon Prime or Netflix or whatever. Uh, and uh, I figured that'd be kind of a cool uh, uh, topic for you guys to be able to ask questions to someone who's actually gone through the process if it's something you've been looking at wanting to do. Uh, so make sure to join us for that. Uh, that'll be uh, Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, right here on YouTube. Uh, and as always... Please like, subscribe, uh, make sure you hit the bell icon for notifications. It helps us out tremendously. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a good rest of your week, and I will see you next week. Thanks for watching.